Hello, I'm Rod Hatt, and welcome to CCI's online training, where we help you understand the business of coal. And welcome to the Glens Creek Distilling Company, where David Meyer has set up an operation and distillery here. He makes wonderful whiskeys like the OCD number no. five. But behind the Glens Creek Distillery is the former Old Crow Distillery. And what we're gonna do is take a look around inside, particularly the boiler house. The, most of the distillery has been removed, but the boiler house is almost 100% intact. Welcome to Glens Creek Distilling. Please visit Dave. It's a little different and a lot better. Now behind the Glens Creek Distillery is the former Old Crow Distillery, where it is reported Dr. James Crow has been distilling whiskey along Glens Creek since 1835. Now most of the distillery equipment is gone, but what we have nearly intact is Boiler 5 from 1965 and boilers one through four from 1935. Welcome to the Old Crow Distillery Boiler House. We've got five boilers here, could make over 200,000 pounds of steam. Come on with me. This is the old side of the boiler house, boilers one through four, the 1935 Westinghouse underfeed retort stokers. I'm sorry, Miss Evelyn. The, I'm sorry, it's the 21st century now. This is what's left. We're from over 80 years ago. Are they still using coal? Not much. They use a little coal to make electricity, but most of the industrial plants and almost all the distilleries have gone to the natural gas. That's really sad to hear. One of the wonderful things about this site is it virtually lived through the Industrial Revolution. Back in the 1850s and 60s, it was just a small outfit. By the 1880s, they expanded and they were using coal and wood. This is the 1986 Sanborn map. It lists coal and wood as the fuel, and it also lists kerosene lighting. So they were using lanterns and kerosene. By the 1900s, we see two new stacks. So they're using coal and wood still, probably with the wood-fired doublers. But 1901, they're still using kerosene lighting. In 1910 or so, they made a big expansion. So here's the 1912 Sanborn map, and you can see they're primarily coal, no more wood, and they've got electric lighting. Steam engines, to most people, are the old railroad engines. Here's the Durango and Silverton Railroad going up the mountain. This is a steam engine and this is what most people think a steam engine is, but really in this Industrial Revolution we saw not only transportations, large steamships and bigger and bigger trains, we saw the Industrial Revolution in the industrial side. So distilleries, cotton gins, cotton mills, corn mills, they were all steam powered, primarily by coal. Unfortunately, like the old steam engines, they've become relics. The boiler themselves have been torn down mostly. But just like this old steam engine on its way for restoration, the steam engines at the Old Pro Distillery are in sad shape and won't run again. Just a little bit of the history of the Old Crow Distillery. What we'll do is take a little bird's eye view and we'll match up the distillery that we have today with the Sanborn maps. The Sanborn fire protection maps are in existence from 1925 going back to 1886. And so I can match up some of the buildings like the big warehouses with the 1925 Sanborn map. The distillery has been partially replaced but the distillery wall from that time period is still existence. And so this is the 1925 Sanborn map. What we're gonna see is a photograph of the 1920s plant. 
You can see that the stack today is different than the 1920s stack there, but we can follow the progression of the distillery. So this is the former Old Crow Distillery operated by the W.A. Gaines Company. And so maybe around the turn of the century, 1901, we have two stacks coming out of the boiler house in the middle of the roof, different from the 1920s. If we go from 1901 back even further to 1886, we can see that the distillery has changed or gotten even smaller and so maybe it was just a little outfit here. The giant four warehouses to the north side don't exist. Now if we reorientate ourselves, looking north now, we see that the distillery has four boilers and four fermentation tubs behind the boiler house in the yellow box. In 1901, we've been expanded to five boilers and eight dis fermentation tubs. We see a large expansion in the 1910 time frame, and in the 1912 Sanborn map, we see the six doublers, wood-fired doublers, four new boilers. The 1925 Sanborn map shows virtually the same distillery. So this is what was improved in the 1935 situation. Today, the distillery is mostly gone. The stainless steel and copper has been taken out but we do have the boiler house. Welcome to the former Old Crow Distillery. What we have here is the 1935 and 1965 boiler houses almost complete. And what this does, particularly if we look back to 1860 or so, is we can see the progression of the Industrial Revolution and the use of coal and steam in an industrial process. In this case, to make whiskey. All right, mate, let's get on with the program. What's this all about? We've been mostly talking about the distillery, but unfortunately the distillery is mostly gone. What we have is boiler five and boilers one through four. What I wanted to do was describe where these different components are in this building. So boiler five from 1965 is on the far left hand side. This wow. is the boiler front oh, for number five. So the coal's right above yes, us. This is and the it comes down into five. the Detroit right, 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 and these we'll sort of spoiling, fling the coal out like in the air. Over 120,000 pounds of steam. The big lump settle down onto produce. the grate. And, and the grate moves towards us. Wow. Did you see that? And boilers one through four are the Westinghouse 1935 Stokers. I remember when it was a Westinghouse retort stoker. Oh, the Westinghouse retort stokers are still here. 100% Westinghouse and 25,000 pounds an hour per boiler. So a total of 100,000 pounds of steam were made down here by the Westinghouse retort wow. stokers. Now, of course, they need coal. So there are coal bunkers located above the firing floor. These are the boilers one through four coal supply chutes coming from the bunker. To get the coal up into the bunkers is a coal handling system. It consists of a bucket elevator and chain conveyors. There are the control panels. We have the Boiler 5 control panel and the Boiler 4 Hagen control system. FD fans are located in the front of the building. Here's the old Boiler 4 FD fan. Unit 5 FD fan is unfortunately probably underneath water. We do have the Boiler ID fans or induced draft fans. Boiler 5 ID fan is located indoors and Boilers 1 through 4 ID fans are located on the roof outdoors. We also have the stack located in the back of the building. The tall stack is for boilers one through four, the short stack for boiler five. There are steam drums still with the boilers. The steam drum is where the steam is separated from the water. For those of you that are interested, 
The old beer well for the distillery has filled with water and fish live there. So there's a little introduction to the old boiler house at the Old Crow Distillery, boilers one through four. It's really sad to see the place look this bad. It used to be really beautiful in here. These are nice transformations of 1935 and 1936 black and white photographs from the Kentucky Historical Society, transforming into the distillery today. Okay, welcome to the 1935 Boiler House. This is the main historic object of this uh, place. And we have nice photographs of them putting in the coal handling system. So they had a rail unloader and a car positioner. They could unload the coal and feed it by bucket elevator up to the bunkers here. Their 1935 Westinghouse multi-retort stoker fired boilers. Looks like they're about 125 PSI. I'm going to be keep looking for the steam flow on them. But there's four boilers of very similar design here. Uh, in 1935, they also built this 150-plus uh, foot stack in the back, the big tall stack. That may have provided the draft for these boilers. I found the turbine-driven FD fans, so this whole plant operated on steam. You have turbine-driven fans, steam-driven stoker, and then it's actually connected to the uh, great shaking system with a big shaft so the faster the retorts spin the more the great shakes. We'll also see that uh, when unit 5 was put in in 1965 they've added onto the co-handling system and they had a pretty effective multi-clone ash separator over there and they were able to run a short stack on number 5. So number 5 stack you don't see very well because it's a little short stack. FD fans might have been part of the original design. It looks like they might have been motor driven in 1965, but potentially the original design was with a steam driven ID fans. They have multi-cone collectors that look a little bit like uh, they were added on, so maybe there's some uh, small ones here and they try to clean them up in the future. Uh, we'll be looking at all this type of equipment. We'll also be looking at the steam, the steam tubes, the steam drums, and then really more exciting is some of the steam engines. We've got uh, mill, corn mills that are steam driven. Like I mentioned, the fans are steam driven. Uh, we have multiple of pumps and uh, we have steam driven boiler feed pumps in the back here we'll take a look at. And we'll try to document not only the boiler systems, but what they ran here at the Old Crow Distillery. Now to get good combustion, you need both coal and air. And air is 21% oxygen, so that's supplying the oxygen for the combustion of the carbon in the coal. When you light these off, you make a reaction where you get flame and heat. And the flame and heat are what the boiler used to boiler the water into steam. If you do a good job at combustion, you'll get the byproducts, both ash from the mineral matter and the rocks in the coal, and flue gas, which consists of only about 6% oxygen now and the resultant about 12% CO2. We'll be studying all these systems, starting with the coal. The coal arrives to the bunkers via a coal handling system. Here's a wonderful 1936 picture, and you can see some of the workers unloading the coal train. The coal train unloads into this grizzly and you can still see some of the rails left over. The grizzly hopper feeds a little rubber conveyor belt and you can just see it in the upper right hand corner of this photograph. This basement is flooded so we don't dare go down there. The little conveyor belt delivers coal to the bucket elevator and here's some of the buckets down at the bottom. 
they went to the rooftop up this big shaft and the equipment at the roof and the motor has been removed. Here's the chain conveyors for boilers one through four. So after the coal comes through the Grizzly and over that little uh, rubber conveyor belt and up the bucket elevator, it connects either with this chain conveyor that feeds units or boilers one through four, or it goes up even taller to reach the boiler five uh, chain conveyor. This is the coal feeding system where it actually conveys the coal all the way to the end of this. It's a nice chain conveyor and this supplies the coal for boilers one through four. So this is the old side, but it's got the same manufacturing as the number five stuff. So I think they got a complete remodel and this is actually a 1965 coal handling system. From the bunkers, the coal was delivered down these chutes to the stokers. Now you would like to combine the coal and air in measured quantities, and that's where combustion control systems come to play. These control systems are definitely controlling the force draft fans. We have the 1935, I believe, Hagen combustion controllers, and the 1965 Bailey combustion control system. One of the more interesting antique devices that I found here at the boiler house is what I believe to be the 1935 Hagen combustion controller. It's a combustion controlling system controlling the force draft fan right here and it can either operate the vanes on the force draft fan or there's actually a steam turbine, a Westinghouse impulse single rotor steam turbine that drives the fan. So I think it was probably hooked up to the veins. A lot of it's missing. But here is a pneumatic combustion control system, probably operating off of drum pressure. So the higher the pressure in the drum, the more coal and air you needed, and this was controlling the air. Interesting enough, in World War II, there was a lot of advertisements from the Hagen Combustion Control System uh, company talking about trying to minimize smoke in the shipping industry. If you're smoking on a ship during the war, you're nothing but a target. This is the boiler number five control panel. And if I could actually see through the black mold and stuff that's on these gauges, I could identify what these gauges actually represent. So maybe I can learn how to clean them. That was easy. Now I can read these things. And right here, I've got the Bailey Combustion Control System, 1965. O2 gauge right here, tracking the oxygen level in the boiler. O2 set point, FD fan and ID fan control points. And right here, an over fire air controller, 1965 technology with over fire air. Over here, I've got feed water temperature coming into the boiler and gas temperatures in and out of the economizer. So 1965, the big boiler, number five, was equipped with an economizer. And this gauge, believe it or not, they sold steam from this boiler. You, you can see that right on the gauge it says Old Taylor Steam Flow. So they kept track of the steam going off to the Old Taylor plant right here. So this is the Unit 5 control panel. Now we've identified most of these things. Steam pressure. Here's my draft gauges on the boiler. Here's my some steam uh, and water pressures over here. And I've got this thing called the II. We're going to learn more about that. I believe that's a boiler drum level indicator. Well, hi, welcome to uh, boiler number five. Uh, you might be able to see some of these doors right here uh, where the operators would be able to check the flame on the grate. This is a Detroit Roto-Grate Stoker. 
The spreader stoker flings the coal onto the grate and the grate slowly moves towards us. And so there's fire on the grate and fire in suspension. And then from this grate, from there, the ash is conveyed to the ash pit. Moving on to the induced draft fans or ID fans. This is the Boiler 5 ID fan. This great big fan sucks the hot gases out of the boiler and puts them up the stack. So right above this fan is the stack. Missing is the big electric motor that drove this fan, but behind the fan actually is the Bailey controller that controls the damper to help balance the draft. So balanced draft boilers have an ID fan and this ID fan tries to keep the front part of the boiler under a negative pressure so that when you look in a door, you actually have air going in the door rather than flames coming out. So the ID fan is a big improvement as far as the, the gases and looking into the boiler. It also uh, allows for pollution control equipment. There's big cyclone collectors between the boiler and the ID fan that remove the ash. And then it goes up the stack from here. Also on this level, over here, the floor is covered with anthracite. I think this was from a roughing filter where they would put the uh, water in right from the source and they would run it through the anthracite roughing filter and that would remove sticks and bugs and leaves and stuff like that but there's anthracite and what remnants of bags of anthracite all over this floor here. The Boiler 5 ID fan directly connects to the short stack on the roof. Let's move back over to the 1935 Westinghouse underfed retort stokers. The underfed stoker was known for producing less smoke. We could see from this 1939 ad almost our exact stokers. We have a boiler front and then we have the inside where the coal is burned on a link grate stoker. Here's the steam supply pipe supplying the steam to the engine that runs the stoker. And so here's the gearing device for the piston crankshaft and the pistons shove the coal into the boiler. In addition, through a big reduction gear is the grate shaker. Okay, don't try this at home, but at least I fit through the door. I wanted to see the inside of the boiler and here's what I see. I see four pistons that provide coal in the slots and then I see the air tears or the link grate stoker. It's constantly shaken by this outside shaft. The ash falls into this ash pit and any fly ash is removed by the cyclone collectors. The ash is then pumped out through pipes to the ash silo where its ash and water are separated at the top of the silo and the ash is hauled away by a truck. And besides the ash, you have the flue gas. Let's take a look at Boilers 1 through 4 ID fans. Welcome to the rooftop of the Boiler 1 through 4, the Westinghouse Retorts. What we have here on the back side of the, uh, on the roof of the boiler is the induced draft fan section. So these are the big fans. Here's number four fan. These are the big fans that suck the gases out of the boiler through air pollution control multi-clone equipment and then they force the gases up the tall stack. So these fans are connected to the tall stack and are located at the rooftop of the boiler house one through four. So I believe that the ductwork, as beautiful as it is, probably comes from 1965. Now the whole point of all these boilers is to make steam. Steam is what does the work. So now in a boiler, the steam is separated from the hot water in the steam drum. Okay, I know I look a little bit uh, worn out and disheveled and actually I'm quite hot, but we're up here at the top of the boiler house now and it's a lot of rickety steps that make me very nervous. So this isn't sweat from heat, this is sweat from nerves. This is the Boiler 5 steam drum and the steam drum is a great big thick piece of metal 
In fact, here's the door where the inspector would have to climb into to, to look at the, the integrity of the steam drum. But the steam drum is where the steam is separated from the water. So about halfway in this big drum is the water level and then they can take the steam off the top. This water level is a very critical part of the boiler control systems. You have to maintain your drum level. If you go too high, you get water in your steam, and if you go too low, you could actually have boiler failure or boiler explosion. So normally there's a sight glass here that an operator could look at. Uh, what they've done is taken some taps down here and put the sight glass down here. But this is also the detector for the eye high. We saw the eye high instrument down in the boiler five control panel, and this is where the signal is coming from to indicate the drum level. The steam comes off the top of the drum and you can see the big steam pipes coming off this. There would also be some pressure relief valves uh, in case you don't, you don't want to overpressure this device or overpressure the boiler. Here are the steam pipes leading to the distillery and even the old Taylor distillery down the road. Now this old distillery is filled with many of the steam engines that these boilers ran. The boiler house steam engines consist of the Westinghouse Stoker fired uh, devices, the Westinghouse FD fans, boiler feed pumps, and some water pumps. The Stokers and the grate are powered by steam. The Stoker uses large pistons to shove the coal into the boiler. The FD fans for boilers one through four are steam turbine driven. Boiler four has been taken apart, but boilers three and two and maybe even one have their turbine still in existence. We can tell they're Westinghouse by rubbing the label a little bit. This is a boiler feed pump. It's a Moore water pump driven by what looks like a steam turbine. If we move over to the distillery, we'll find a lot of steam engines. There's a corn mill powered by a Terry turbine. Terry turbines are famous for their existence still in the nuclear fleet of the U.S. Navy. One of the oldest engines is the Leffel. It's connected to a mash stirrer. There are several Worthington steam pumps for pumping things like beer and water. And the pump house contains a Riley steam pump listed in the 1912 Sanborn map. and we found a Westinghouse turbine-driven mill in the mash processing area. Thank you for letting me share my passion of antiques and coal-fired power plants. This has been a wonderful opportunity to explore antique boilers. I don't think they're gonna ever run again, but we've made a nice documentary of some of the equipment that exists here and thought back a little bit about how it might have been used. Hello, I'm Rod Hat, and I wanted to introduce you to my anti Amy. This is Coleman Poor. I'm sorry, Coleman. Coleman, thanks so much for all the help with like the drone flying and the showing up at unexpected times. Well, thank you, Rod. It's been a lot of fun helping you out. I had a lot of wonderful memories. I had a lot of wonderful memories here. <laughs>